Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live. Yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Okay, I tell y'all every week that the greatest joy is that I actually get to sit back during the day and listen to the General Assembly committee sessions, floor sessions, the Senate, the House, all of that. Couple of observations. Yeah, we're gonna talk about the bills, definitely that. Couple of observations. If anyone knows Senator Liz Brown, uh, District 15, just north of Fort Wayne up there, could somebody go give her a hug? Could somebody just wrap their arms around her? Cause that is a mean little woman. She just, I, she, it seems like she comes into session just mad at the world. You have the joy of being an elected official and representing, representing your community. And you show up every day with an attitude. I'm gonna need you to fix that. Somebody go bake her a cake, take her some pie, something to sweeten up that disposition. Cause I'm telling you, Ooh, she, I, there's a reason why I ain't been elected yet. There's a reason, but there's also another reason. I don't know, it, I, I can't think of the people's name, but I watched two little twits, one in the Utilities, Energy and Telecommunications Committee, and another one in the Government and Regulatory Reform Committee, just talk down and condescendingly to our reps. Like one dude, talked to, to Representative Cherish Pryor like she had no education whatsoever. And he looked like a little young fella. I, I'm a, I don't know if what kind of manners y'all people were taught when they were younger, but my mother and my father always made sure that I was respectful to my elders, regardless of the position that I held. I'm gonna need these little people whatever they are in their feelings to try to be more respectful to the people who actually won their elections too. I mean, one person talked to Chris Campbell, representative Chris Campbell, like she didn't win her election. Like she was just there cause they, she was a volunteer or something. That's just me and my observation. People and they need to get their stuff together. I mean, I know y'all have a super majority and I know that y'all feeling real Vin Dieselly about it all, but I'm gonna need y'all to find a way to be a little bit more respectful. And I know they're not hearing me, they're not listening to this, but if you know them, go talk to them. See if you can get them some manners. Maybe, maybe. But that being said, there's a lot of bad legislation coming out of the state house, and I want to touch on a few things. Uh, you know, the Indianapolis Star is a good place for me to kind of grab that information so I can, because I'm listening to it, but I'm also working, so I can't write everything down. So the Indianapolis Star does a really good job of kind of recapping what's happening at the state house. So if you get a chance to go over there, check it out. But I'll go ahead and highlight just a few things. Uh, Republicans say they still plan to pass HB 1008 which seeks to ensure that Indiana isn't giving special favor to financial institutions with social, political, or, I or ideological interests when it comes, uh, when it invests billions of dollars in state retirement funds. This bill was authored by Ethan Manning, a, a Republican from Logansport. Houston told the Indy Star this week that the bill remained a high priority uh, for House Republicans and an amendment should tighten up some of the bill's language. Um, Houston said it still expects the bill to pass the House. Democrats were happy about the amendment and that it was moved on the agenda. The bill should never see the light of day, says Representative Ed Delaney. That, that, I can't even talk today. Ed Delaney of Indianapolis. It, it's encouraging that my Republican colleagues are beginning to recognize how foolish it would be to hurt companies with bright futures for the sake of propping up companies on the decline. Sound familiar, y'all? The bill received an initial hearing last week, but hit a speed bump 
when a financial an analysis was released that estimate estimates the bill would cost Indiana's public retirement system as much as six point seven billion dollars in returns over the next decade. According to the analysis, based on a new information provided by the Indiana public retirement system, it would drop the expected rate of return from 6.2% to roughly 5%. Such a large decrease in investment earnings would result in increased unfunded liability and could require a significant increase in both employer contributions and state fund appropriations to make up the difference. See, <clears throat> These people have their ideology all lined up on what it is that they want to pass. Oh, well, if they down with, you know, woke, we want to make sure that they're not investing any of these retirement dollars into anything woke. You, you know, this is what it is, right? But they're not bright enough to recognize the financial implications of what they're talking about. And, you know, you could have an ideolo ideological idea, but... At the sake of of costing retirees the the opportunity to to have their full benefits, see that's clownish and it doesn't think long term, y'all. That's why it's so important oh, that we put people on the ballot and run for office. Mm. Think about that. A bill to allow for partisan races was passed out of the House Committee Wednesday, marking the first time this effort received a vote in the Indiana State House. And this is school board races. They are now, it passed out of committee, it's going to the full House. Last year, this bill had some opposition. It didn't actually get a vote, but this year, they are. It's going to it pass out of committee. There was a lot of testimony about this. There was someone who had been elected multiple times via nonpartisan. There were people who were like, well, we want to know if you are an R or a D or we want to know what your you know ideology is. See, y'all not smart enough to understand that even though I may be a D there, I don't agree 100 percent with D's. So. You want people to be R so that, that you think that they're going to follow along exactly with what you want. But that's not going to happen everywhere. So you're going to put some D's on a ballot and, and the R's are never going to get a chance. But they don't think of it like that. See, because they are solely focused on taking over these school boards. I need y'all to understand that. If you have not decided to run for office or if you have and you're not really sure where to go, run for school board. Because you see, that's where all the trauma and 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 angst was last year because for some reason people think that critical race theory is a thing being taught in primary and secondary schools it's not and i'm i'm really sick and tired of non-educated people or people who do, are not scholarly trying to decide what teachers are teaching when they don't even know themselves they don't even know ask somebody what crt is they can't tell you but i will say this Parents of brown, black, Asian, LGBTQ plus parents who are sending your kids to these schools who continue to want to marginalize, make sure you show up and you complain because there's more hit to our history than European history. Hold them accountable. Let them know your child is, is having issues because they can't learn about where their people came from. You can do that. You can do that. All right. The last thing, uh, House Bill 1569. This Indiana House, uh, the Indiana House Committee passed a bill Wednesday that would prevent imprisoned people from using state dollars for gender affirming surgery. Republicans who back the bill say they're protecting taxpayers from paying for what they consider an unnecessary procedure. Democrats and LGBTQ plus advocates say this is a preemptive attack on an already marginalized group over a procedure not being provided in, Indi in Indiana facilities. Should the procedure become more prevalent, they said, the law could create unilateral policy for what should be a case-by-case -case decision patients make with their doctor over what's widely considered a necessary medical procedure in certain situations. 36 people are receiving hormone therapy for gender dysphoria. 
a clinical diagnosis describing this discomfort in someone's biological sex not matching their gender identity. In Indiana's jail and prisons, Mayfield told the committee, another 21 are currently being assessed for accommodations. But something you guys should know, the DOC does not currently provide sexual reassignment surgery, according to House Bill's 1569's fiscal note. As diagnosis for gender dysphoria increase, Indiana is likely to see more requests. It's not happening, people. And seeing a, a, a state dollar, state dollars are not currently being used except in court mandated case. Representative Matt Pierce of Bloomington said he doesn't see why the legislature should pursue this bill and that they should leave it to the courts. Okay, so this is a bill looking for a problem that doesn't actually exist. We want to prevent uh, tax dollars for gender reaffirming surgery, but there are no gender reaffirming surgeries. There are an unprecedented number of anti LGBTQ plus bills going through our state house right now. They are coming for us. They're trying to silence us and they're trying to push us back into the closet. Well, check it out. Ain't enough room for me and my shoes in the closet. So I'm just going to be out here and I'm going to be loud and proud. And anybody that wants to come with me, come on, come with me. But the bottom line is, is they are attacking us. And do you not realize, do they not realize, and are we, have we not been clear enough that we are taxpaying citizens as well and we pay their salaries and their attempt to continue to marginalize our LGBTQ plus community is, is you, you're using my tax dollars to marginalize me. I'm having a problem with it. I'm having a real problem with it. But, you know, I sit on the board of Indiana Stonewall Democrats. If you don't have anything else to do this Saturday, Come out to our Love is Love event because we are raising money. All of the money that we raise goes toward our endorsed candidates. Our endorsed candidates are people who are going to fight for us, fight for our community. We, will get, we give them financial contributions. That's what we do because we don't have enough people in the state house. We have one out. I'm going to say it like that because, you know, Republicans always be wanting to touch somebody at a conference and, and, and don't nobody know about it until... <laughs> they get a complaint. But we have only one out and proud LGBTQ plus elected official in that state house, and he can't do it by himself. We got to send him some help in both chambers. So all of my LGBTQ plus folk come to our fundraiser. Talk. Let's talk about you running for office and all of our allies. You know, we support you, too. So don't trip. We got you. Don't trip. There's always space for everybody on Stonewall, you know what I'm saying? Cause the spectrum, like to be the extremes is, is the minority. I mean, everybody knows what a bell curve is, right? There are more people in the middle. <laughs> you just think you got to embrace your inner middle. You got to embrace your inner middle. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right, candidates, you know, you, you, the filing deadline is coming gone and you've got your budget and you know, the, what you need, the things that you require to have an effective campaign. Do you need content creation? Of course you do. You need somebody that can help you put together a nice video short, 30 seconds or less. Hit Black Pearl, IT Solutions, Black Pearl Studios, and Indiana's own Dana Black. Talk to me. Let me help you put together some content. I'm not here to make a whole lot of money. I'm trying to elect Democrats. Let's just keep it real. Because you can find somebody that can do a $5,000 video for you. That's not what I'm here for. I'm trying to help you guys, help our candidates get the exposure they need, get their messaging out so that they can continue the hard work so I can get more people in the state house to, to fight against crap bills. Y'all hear me fussing about it? Help me out. So let me help you help, help me. Let me, yeah, that's it. Let me help you help you. Indiana's old day in a black turn left, black for IT solutions. So look me up so that you can get the necessary uh, content created for your campaign. All right. It's time for my guest. <laughs> I'm super excited about our guest because, you know, one, I don't think that we pay enough attention to Fort Wayne. So this is the second week in a row that I've had someone running for the at-large seat in Fort Wayne for the city council. First of all, she's a Hoosier woman forward. She's everywhere making a name for herself. She done dropped the gauntlet. She said, I'm here. She, she's doing, doing a thing. Y'all give it up for 
Stephanie Crandall running for city council at large in Fort Wayne. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited that you are here. Now, Connor Wright is new to me. I've met him probably a couple of times because I spend a lot of time in Bloomington. The little blue dot that could. So I'm excited to see that we have young people who are staying, willing to work hard and stay in Indiana to try to help our cities and our state be better. That's what's exciting. A, 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 an engaged young person. Y'all need to get some more. Y'all give it up for my guy, Connor Wright, who is running for Bloomington City Council District 3. Connor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to talk about the campaign and, and getting young people involved in the whole nine yards. I love it. Okay, first question out the gate. Did y'all watch the State of the Union? <laughs> okay, we know President Biden gave, you know, all he did. But I got to ask, did you like his, his sucker move, his rope-a-dope move he did on the Republicans? Because, yes, they've been talking about getting rid of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. But tell me, what did y'all think of the State of the Union? Stephanie, you can go first. I'll let ladies go first. Uh, I thought it was full of optimism. I mean, he, he had a clear message of the fact that the work's not done yet. There's a lot that he's accomplished in the first few years, but there's a lot more to do. And he's willing to roll up his sleeves and get that work done. Um, and that's really, you know, a lot about what happens on the local level, too. So I really related to what he was saying about what was going on in D.C. because we have so much that we have to do and we have to work with each other. And as long as we have that same goal of pr um, promoting our democracy, and really making sure that we are committed to our country, then we will be able to do those things together. Absolutely. What say you, Connor? Yeah, I thought it was a pretty good speech. Uh, usually a state of the union is a little bit boring and you know feels <laughs> as long as it is. But this time it was actually, you know, it was exciting, it was interesting, I thought. And I really liked, you know, the little section they had where he was playing with the audience a little bit. And he actually did that a few times. I thought that was really good. Well, and for for people who think he seems to be so slow and he's so old, he played him like a fiddle, baby. He was like, you know, some of these Republicans, and they were like, they first of all, the decorum is out the window. We're going to let that go now. We went from one clown shouting down President Barack Obama to a whole choir section now <laughs> of maggots <laughs> just making a bunch of noise. You know, I, I I hope he holds him to it. He's on his tour now. You know, uh, they wanted to call him a liar because he was reading from their pamphlet. But I'm glad you guys had a chance to read it. All right. That's our discussion on State of the Union. I thought it was fun. I thought it was. I just enjoyed the comedy, honestly. Uh, so now this is where we get to find out about our candidates, why they're running. But more importantly, you guys, their donate link is right there. Go ahead and click. If you like something they're talking about, please, please, please donate to their campaigns. Just click on the link. I'm telling you, they could use $5 goes a long way. All right, Stephanie, tell the people who you are and where you come from. So I have worked for the mayor of Fort Wayne for the last nine and a half years. Mayor Henry. Um, yes, I have. Mayor Henry. Yeah. I've been part of his administration and been doing a lot of things on behalf of the citizens of Fort Wayne. But my story goes back way before then. Actually, it was the first day of my civics class in ninth grade when my teacher asked what special event in history had just experienced a milestone anniversary. And I raised my hand and said that it had been the 75th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, giving some women the right to vote. And that led to a conversation about how few women there were in government. And at that moment, I felt a spark inside me light and really call me into a career in public service. So everything I've done since then has been tied to serving in government. And really, I've been focused a lot more, mostly on local government. Went to law school so that I can understand how laws were made. Worked with a law firm in Indianapolis where my, most of my clients were local government. Went to D.C. and advocated on behalf of local government on the federal level. And then have been serving here in Fort Wayne um, on the local government level to make sure that we can actually get things done. So I'm really excited about taking my my career to the next level and being part of the Fort Wayne City Council to be able to make sure that we are serving all of our community and that we are really providing those services and helping people realize that government is not something to be scared of. It is accessible 
um, but it has a place that we have to be able to make sure that we are serving every single one of our residents. I love that. And so, you know, I, I'm glad that you brought up the fact that we as women are well underrepresented based on our population, right? We're 51% of the population. And yet we're around 30% nationwide at all levels total uh, of elected leaders. To me, that's problematic. How did it, how, yeah. how, yeah. How do you think it would be different or we could have a greater impact if we allowed more women or we had more women elected to office? We are much more collaborators when we're at the table. You know, we work with each other to find out where are our common grounds. And even though we have differences, we might be able to address those. So, I mean, right now, Fort Wayne City Council has two women on it. And as far as I can remember, it's really only had a couple. So we need more women at the table. And that's part of the reason why I'm running is to make sure that we have those voices. There's a lot of times where on behalf of Mayor Henry, I walk into a room and I might be the only woman. And so making sure that we have people who look like us, who represent our thoughts and feelings and our experiences, and who are also willing to hear from everybody else about their experiences and share those as well. And that's what women bring to the table is hearing from each other and having that empathetic nature that really gives us the confidence to be able to create solutions that co go to the heart of the problems and not necessarily just focus on um, some short wins. So I think we, when we bring women to the table, we really get better solutions. I agree, except for there are a couple of women I'm gonna need to throw overboard. We 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 can do that. We can do that. You know that that Bobart, <laughs> yeah yeah, uh, MJ whatever, MJG whatever. <laughs> kind of right. The empathy, right? Right. right. Uh, some some gotta go. Some gotta go. Like, have you seen those memes? Like, they give you like f f six different actors and you got to choose one to go yeah they going <laughs> they going connor right tell the people who you are and where you come from yeah so i am in bloomington currently i grew up in noblesville indiana before i came here oh. for school so i go to iu bloomington i'm still an undergraduate uh which is a big part of why i'm running um bloomington is 50 percent students we are a college town as many people know but there's never been an undergraduate on city council in Bloomington's Ooh. history. And there, the last time there was a student period on city council was about 50 years ago. And they were a law student um, at IU. And I think it's important to have, you know, different perspectives on city council. Uh, I'm sure both of you agree with that, but, you know, having the young perspective, yes. I think is very important, especially as a student, because, you know, a lot of our city is renters and there's no one on city council that rents. And we also have a housing affordability crisis. So it's kind of difficult to solve that issue uh, if you don't really have experience with you know, one aspect of the housing affordability crisis. Because owning a home and renting are vastly different. Um, Absolutely. And also, I just think it's important to, to have people that you know use different forms of transportation. I don't typically drive. I usually ride my bike or walk. Sometimes that's dangerous. I almost got hit by a car today. So what? I think it's, yeah. And it, it happens, you know, like once a week. So, you know, we need to do more to protect cyclists and pedestrians here and you know, just take care of all Bloomingtonians. And that's kind of crazy that you're telling me that in a in a college town, somebody, well, but they, I guess down on Kirkland, a couple of folks got hit by a car not long ago, right? Just like in a couple months yeah. ago. It's yeah. a semi-regular occurrence, unfortunately. So last week I had Sean Johnson on and he is the president of the uh, Allen County Young Democrats. And we talked about the importance of infusing that young energy and the perspective of young people. I'm still trying to figure out where my Woodstock people went to. They I don't know what happened to them. You know, they they were the revolutionaries. And then I don't know. I don't know. Talk, I, I, you hit, I'm telling you, you hit on some things that are so incredibly important because when you have the, don't have a diversity of thought, that means all, everybody's issues are not being addressed. And now what do you say to those though, who are like, but Connor, you know, you haven't lived long enough. Cause I've been guilty of saying it. <laughs> yeah. That's something people don't really say that up front. <laughs> it's kind of something that they're thinking. They're not like, mm, sorry, I don't, I don't really support young people. But they'll be like, oh, I'm looking for somebody else. What that yeah. really means is you're pretty young. I don't think you know what you're doing. I'm going to try to find someone who's closer to my age or has more experience. And I think 
you know, I still have experience. It's not the same experience, but it's different experience. And it, it's experience nonetheless. And I think that's what we what we need in government is people with different experience. You now we don't need to be gatekeeping people from working in government just because you know, they haven't had a 10 year career at you know, a law firm or a 10 year career in government in some capacity. And you know, we should get people from all over the community who accurately represent the people that make up the community to serve in government. I, I couldn't agree with you more 100%. When I ran for office in 2015, 2016, I was I had never ran for office before. I didn't come from a legacy, a family. I was an IT chick. And there were those people who were like, you know, you got to kiss some rings. I'm not kissing nobody's ring. I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm going to go fight for my community because I feel like it's not being done. And I feel that. And, and Stephanie, golly, did this young man not hit on a lot of the things that we talk about as women? I know he hit on things that we talk about as black people. And I know he talks about things that we hit on as gay folk. Talk about how now we see in our party, in our big tent, we have we may have very different experience, lived experiences, but there we recognize the similarities in all of that. Yeah, I mean, even when Connor's speaking, I, I got my start uh, in politics. I restarted the College Democrats back when I was in college, and I'm not too far removed from the Young Dems, just slightly. Um, <laughs> but I have a long time long de uh, Young Dem activist of being uh, actually the general counsel for the Indiana Young Dems when I lived in Indianapolis. So we all have a place where we got started. And that's another thing where we can find those similarities when we share our stories with each other, when we get to you know experience what's going on in our lives, but finding about what you know brought us to this point. So for me, actually, I got my start in politics. Um, you know, my dorm room was the headquarters for uh, the Electoral College count for Bush v. Gore. And so people who weren't very active in politics became a little bit more active when they walked past my dorm room. And that's what we need. We do need a variety of experiences at the table and helping people realize that we do have a lot more in common than we have different. Absolutely. So, Connor, I got to ask, because I think I struggle and I think of because, uh, you know, when you on this side of 50, <clears throat> you don't you you lose touch a little bit with the, the culture. Right. I, I ain't gonna lie, because if I'm if I'm listening to music from this century, it's I don't know. Right. Um, Talk to us. Talk to us old heads on what we need to do to be to to engage young folks and and encourage you guys to be more in the fold because we i don't know i'm i'm messing up i'm not doing it right so tell me what i need to do you have to do it for me but just kind of give me some hints yeah well first first of all i don't really recognize songs from this decade either to be honest i listen to like 60s 70s and 80s music almost entirely so <laughs> Like a pretty similar old soul. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't told I have an old soul, but you know, when it comes to engaging young people, I think just you know showing up and and being there for them and supporting them uh, is a is a huge step. I um, mean, our College Democrats chapter, you know, gets a lot of support from some community members, not all of them, but some of them, and you know, we really appreciate all the support they were getting from those community members, and then we turn right around and help them, you know, keep their jobs or move up the ladder and do whatever they want to do in their future. So I think, you know, investing in young people uh, is a big thing because, you know, you just need to have a big bench. You know, you never know who is going to end up making it through, uh, but you need to have a bunch of different options. I love it. So got, it, turn left listeners, I'm going to drop you some names of some young people that I know for sure on the ballot. Dylan Little down in uh, uh, Dearborn County, Sean Johnson, up in Allen County. Now we got Connor Wright down in, ha in Monroe County. And of course, Nick Roberts here in Marion County. Now they're all guys. So where are my young girls at? I'm a young ladies. I'm gonna need you to come on now. But these young fellas, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you, these young fellas um, have it. And what do I mean by they have it? They don't mind putting the work in. They don't mind putting themselves out there. I've had conversations with, it's my first time really, really having a good conversation with Connor, which I'm really excited about. So, all right, let's, the, remember those names, follow those people, get to know them because young people, that's our bench. Y'all keep asking, where's our bench? That's our bench. So, all right, every candidate, every campaign has some issues that they are focused in on and which propel them to put them put their name on the ballot. Uh, I'm, Connor, I'm gonna start with you. You named off quite a few things already in your opening, but I want you to dive deeper into 
what those issues are that made you decide to run for office and and also not just talk about the issue, but maybe some of the solutions that you may have for those issues as well. I'm going to ask you, Stephanie, to do the same thing, but I'm going to start with Connor this time. Yeah, I didn't name a few of them. Uh, housing affordability is number one. It's number one for most people who are running for office in Bloomington, just because it is a big problem here and it's not really getting better. Uh, but I think the solution is to embrace change a little bit in our community. You know, if the city is not growing, then it's dying. And so we have to keep changing. We have to you know, keep uh, building more houses for people to live here. Because it's really, it's great to create a bunch of jobs, which we, we do. Bloomington's a thriving economy. But if we don't have the same number of housing units coming in with the jobs, you know, then that creates the market that we have right now where you know, it's very hard to find an affordable home. And if you have a budget of under $1,000 a month for an apartment, there's only like four or five spots that you can live in the city. And they're not always the most desirable spots. So, you know, we need right. to increase the supply of housing chiefly, um, as well as, you know, embrace a little bit of change and recognize that, you know, as sad as it may be, things aren't always going to be the exact same and we have to keep up with the times. Okay. Uh, a couple other issues that are transportation. It's not just, that includes like public transportation and, you know, safety when we're walking and, biking around the city. And I mean, I'm a big believer in protected bike lanes. It's not a magic bullet, but it is a lot better than not having a protected bike lane. Cause I mean, a, a line of paint on the ground doesn't stop a car from doing anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, we got, we got some roads where people like to go pretty fast. So it's a little bit scary to be biking on the same roads as cars. Um, and I think, you know, public transportation just needs to run more frequently. You know, it's mm. kind of devastating to miss the bus here in Bloomington because then you have to wait for 30 more minutes for the next one. And, you know, I think you shouldn't have to plan your day right catching the bus. You should just be able to walk to a bus stop and expect that one will be there in 15 minutes or less. And then the last thing is uh, climate change um, mm. and sustainability, mm -hmm. especially as a young person. Like I've grown up seeing too many historic events happen and continue to happen because climate change is really kind of taking the center stage. Um, you know, as I was becoming a teenager and, you know, in middle school and whatnot. And so that's a, that's a big one for me. And, you know, I, I just want to encourage the city to um, use more green and renewable energy and, you know, practice or, and, and have better practices for recycling and, you know, using our food waste to compost and, you know, do good things and, and then encourage people to landscape uh, in more environmentally friendly ways. You know, you, you just said something um, that triggered a thought. Your generation has witnessed, uh, had to experience things at such a young age that, I'm be honest, I was, a I was a kid in the 70s and a teenager in the 80s. And to mind you, you know, we didn't have the internet back then. That may have been a good thing, right? Because I could, like, go outside and play kickball in the streets until the streetlight came on and we were good, right? Um how has like I, I feel I feel like maybe you guys unfortunately didn't even get a chance to really enjoy your innocence because you're having to witness tr witness trauma or experience trauma. I didn't even use the word trauma until I was in my fifties. Like real talk. How is how is witnessing you know the like the earthquake that is happening over in turkey and in syria right now and the hurricanes and the flooding and just the upheaval um of someone trying to overthrow the government and nancy Pelosi. i mean so much right so much how how have you been able to weather that and how, how are you able to use that to work to improve the community that you live in yeah, I mean, social media has contributed a lot to that. It's kind of an information overload a lot of times. Because normally, I mean, I wasn't alive in the 70s, but, you know, my parents... No, were really? Also. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might be kind of obvious if you look at me, but, you know, <laughs> they, they would be focused on, you know, their communities. Like, my dad grew up around Anderson, Indiana. So he didn't really hear a whole lot about what was going on outside of Anderson and maybe Indianapolis. But now I hear about stuff that happens in California, Turkey, France you know, the entire world, basically. And, yeah, it can be a lot because, you know, when you have a lot of climate uh, catastrophes happening you know, across the world, it's not just forest fires in Indiana or California or Oregon. It's forest fires in Brazil and, you know, the entire rest of the world. Um, you know, it, it can cause a lot of stress for people. 
And I think you can turn that into positive uh, energy um, by realizing that, you know, we need solutions immediately. Well, we really, we needed them yesterday, but now is the second best time uh, to, to combat climate change and other problems that we're facing. So just being a passive bystander and seeing what's happening is really going to stress you out and make your life miserable. So you kind of have to do something. So how do we get people to recognize that what you do on a city level can impact something as massive as climate change? I remember having a conversation with a young lady who was like, I've, I've been into the African-American community and I can't seem to get them engaged in climate change. And I had to remind her, well, they're worried about the more immediate. You know, do they have enough milk for their kids? How do you tra have that conversation of, listen, if we don't do what we can here in Bloomington, if, or what does the impact of that we're doing in Bloomington, how can it impact a global crisis? How do you have that conversation? Yeah, well, I think the, the, it's difficult, uh, you know, climate change being a global crisis because in some ways everybody is a little bit responsible, some more than Hello. others, but you know, we're all a little bit responsible. And so it's really hard to say, well, I'm one of 7 billion people. My actions are going to change things. Uh, but, you know, when, you, when we all come together and we all do our part, you, know, you actually will change things. And I think, you know, for a city like Bloomington, a lot of people believe in climate change. A lot of people take it seriously, as well as a number of other issues. And so they kind of understand that, you know, as a city, we, we do need to, to do what we're doing um, to, to do everything we can uh, to combat climate change and these other problems and be a model for the rest of the country and maybe even the rest of the world. Because if we have a super good idea that works really, really well, other cities around the country are going to see that and they're going to copy us. And suddenly we're having an influence on the entire globe. I love that. I love that. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a fan already. All right, Stephanie, what are the issues? And also offer up some solutions, please. Yeah. So we have a lot of the same issues going up North of, uh, in Indiana too, uh, in Fort Wayne. Uh, housing is a huge issue. We know that we are a great place to raise a family and a great place to retire, but we need to make sure that we have housing options that provide for us at every stage of life that are affordable, accessible, and allow us to stay in our homes. Uh, so making sure that we are having the right housing stock all over the city too. We know that there are some places that uh, we're not building houses. A lot of houses actually are being built right outside the city limits. So thinking about where does smart infill make sense and how can we help people then afford those houses? And for the city of Fort Wayne, one of the things I'm uh, pushing for is partnerships, really working with our community partners, the banks, um, and just everybody who has a part in helping people become homeowners. And then also recognizing homeownership isn't for everyone too. Uh, I was actually a first time home buyer when I moved here. It took me over a year to find a house and thinking about where those rentals that are affordable too, and making sure that we have safe housing for people. So that regardless of what your income is, that you have a safe place and a quality place to live. We talked a lot about quality of life, but really should everybody deserves a quality place to live as well. I have a quick uh, question before, issues, I mean, wait, before you go. I have a quick question. You said something that I'm not familiar with. You said smart infill. What is that? So we have vacant lots right now, you know, that um, we're trying to figure out what can we do with those? Are they working with our neighbors to figure out, you know, that they want to adopt them as part of their lots? Um, does it make sense working with Habitat to build homes? You know, what what is the options for those places? And how can we help the neighborhoods think about how they want to grow their own area? Okay. Um, and really, that's about communication back and forth and making sure that the city is working with all of our residents to think about what makes sense on each block. Uh, and not just a one size fits all for the entire city. See, you listen to Turn Left, you're gonna learn new stuff. Smart infield is the word for the day. Go ahead on Miss Crandall, keep talking about your issues up there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and a lot of the other things that we're doing too uh, with safe neighborhoods. I know people mm. want to think about that about public safety, but when we're investing in our sidewalks, what are the sidewalks doing? They are providing transportation as Connor mentioned, but they're also helping us connect with each other. So what? for me, what I'm really focused on is making sure that the city is providing services that help us connect with one another because our greatest asset in Fort Wayne is our people. Mm -hmm. And we know that when we have the ability to um, be supported and be able to realize our opportunities, everyone prospers. So again, that's attracting businesses here that attract and retain workers um, and help us provide for every form of family that we have. 
I really want to make sure that Fort Wayne's on the map for being a connected city and really being, as, as you mentioned before, it's about the love. It's about loving our neighbors and really mm -hmm. making sure that we are mm -hmm. looking out for each other and that we become that family because a lot of people move to Fort Wayne for family. That's why I moved here, I'm now raising my family here. Um, but your traditional family may not be there all the time. And so your mm -hmm. neighbors and the people that you're communing with, those become your family members. And that's what I would love Fort Wayne to be on the map for is a place where everyone feels like they belong here and that I we're looking that. out for each other and that we're helping each other really reach our full potential by realizing our gifts and our talents. I love that family. Ah. All right, next. <laughs> I oh, get yeah, excited. I, I mean, it, well, I mean, it, you know, if you think about Hoosier Women Forward, right? It's our sisterhood and helping each other um, strive to reach our full potential in whatever part of the, the state we're in. And I know I've been the beneficiary of a lot of opportunities like that and helping me get to where I am. It, you know, right now, even through my campaign, I am getting to meet people who have amazing gifts and talents. And that's what I love about being able to talk with my neighbors more and find out, you know, what makes you proud to live in Fort Wayne? And I what are it. the challenges that you see and how can we work together to address those challenges? Really, that comes from taking the time to get to know each other and valuing each other. Uh, you know, one of the programs that I have been part of in, in Fort Wayne with the city um, is really focused on what is our shared humanity? It's called Fort Wayne United and um, helping people realize that every person in our community should be respected, appreciated mm -hmm. and valued for mm -hmm. what they have to offer. We are here at this time in our lives for a unique moment and we get to experience life together. You know, when Connor was talking about the climate change, um, my almost eight-year-old son the other night was asking me, mom, are we going to have a tsunami in, in Fort Wayne? Wow. And I had to reassure him that we might have flooding um, and maybe a tornado, but, you know, we don't think we're going to have a tsunami here. Think it's up in the air, though. That. It's up in the air right now. I ain't going to lie to you. <laughs> Well, but what is that impact that we're leaving for our children? You know, yeah. really, it's about it's about what the next generation and making yeah. sure that they have a strong community to grow up in, uh, regardless yeah. of it, whatever their experience is. W one of the statistics that scares me and that I'm really focused on of uh, changing is that a child who grows up in Southeast Fort Wayne has a life expectancy that's 20 years less than a child who grows up in Southwest Fort Wayne. That's unacceptable. And we as a city have to do more to make sure that our children are being able to realize their full potentials and live their full lives. So there's a variety of policies that I've been working on with the mayor in internally. And I know I can do a lot more on the outside of being on the city council table and fighting for those policies. So one of the things about the city council that a lot of people don't necessarily understand, first of all, everybody should know all politics is local. And, and this is where we're going to, you know, join on in this conversation together. So I, um, I don't care who goes first. It's the fiscal body. It's the body that uh, it's a legislative branch. It's the body that allocates funds. Um, talk to me about that piece of legislation, that first piece of legislation you want to see it come across. And if you don't see it, you may actually introduce it yourself when you win. And then I want you, because I've heard there's, there is no right or wrong answer to this. So I'm, I want to set y'all up, but, but I want you to talk to me uh, on how you feel about TIFFs and, and how they impact your city and how you would like to use those to improve. Because I know this is the boring part. This is the part where we actually talk about <laughs> what you'll actually do on council. So it's the fiscal body. What's the per first piece of bill? And then how um, would you like to use TIFFs if you use them? So I know for me, um, the fiscal body, it might not be the first bill, but it's probably the most important, and that's the city budget. And we know that when you see your budget, you see your values. And one of the places where our current, well, our, our city councils for the past few years have not invested as much in is our community development. In mm -hmm. fact, we even had a city council member one time um, uh, propose cutting the entire community development department. And that's not good. What? You know, we have... <laughs> really important city departments with public safety, parks, public works. Those are the traditional places mm -hmm. that people think of when they think of city uh, services. But our community development division is absolutely necessary because they're the ones who are working with our neighborhood leaders to make sure that we're looking out for each other. Right. And so I would like to see more funds put in our community development department because there's important programming that needs to go on. And it leads then to 
the ability to um, attract people to live here. There's yeah, there's a goes, yeah, there's an yeah. ROI in that. There's a definite ROI to that. Sorry, absolutely. When we build up our people, then the rest will come. And so I want to make sure that we're doing more for that. And um, I'll let Connor weigh in a little bit more on that part. But then I'm happy to talk about TIFF because I was a public finance attorney for a few years. And so uh, oh, Connor, we in trouble. <laughs> Our economic development incentives are, are a key part of thinking about what makes sense for a community. And that's something that I would bring to the table is the experience of being able to understand those policies. All right. So she's letting you uh, jump in on uh, the fiscal body and maybe that first bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, some of the, the first priorities I would have would be you know, expanding our bike infrastructure in Bloomington. Uh, we have two one-way streets to kind of go through the heart of our city. Uh, Walnut Street and College Avenue, and they don't have protected bike lanes. Uh, the cars like to go kind of fast on them. So I think putting protected bike lanes in those spots uh, would go a long way towards you know, making sure cyclists are safe, um, as well as you know making sure that you know, I, we also have a, a, a street called Kirkwood, which you know, people have been to Bloomington. They probably heard of that. It's like our main mm. drag. <laughs> Students love to go there and you know, eat food and have fun. Um, and sometimes during the summer, it's blocked, like cars are blocked off from Kirkwood. Mm -hmm. So it's just a pedestrian only area. Mm -hmm. And I would kind of like to expand that and maybe look at other areas in the city where we can Ooh, you know, nice. have pedestrian only spots because it's, a, it's really fun. Like you, you walk down Kirkwood and there's just people going everywhere, shopping, yeah. eating. And, and it's really safe because you, you don't have to worry about getting ran over by a car when you're walking in the middle of the street. You just have to make sure you don't run into the person who's walking around in front of you. <laughs> It almost it, when I'm because you know my girlfriend live down there, and it's almost like it's a real city when I'm. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. It's a town. I get it. But it's almost like it's almost like I'm like okay. I'm feeling the vibe. I go down and we eat at uptown, and we eat outside. You know, go to go to the spots. Malibu is it, is it still Malibu? Or did they change the name? I can't remember. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, there is a Malibu grill. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yep. So, to, okay, y'all, dive into these tiffs. Do you, Stephanie, do you want Connor to go first? Because it looks like you ready, you ready to jump into that. All right, Connor, talk about these tiffs. Yeah, so our city, um, they don't really like to use them too much uh, for understandable reasons. I mean, we don't, like people in Bloomington have already had their taxes raised uh, over the past four, eight years, something like that. Uh, a little bit, not like a huge amount, but a little bit. Um, and just a few weeks ago, they actually uh, passed a bond that would fund a new police headquarters here. So, you know, we have to, when we're, when we're thinking about like raising more funds to do things, and you know, we need to really think about what the return on the investment is for it. And, you know, if there's better uses for that money, or if we could, you know, just build our priorities into the budget and, you know, spend less money doing something else. Uh, so I think it's important, especially when you're talking about like people's money, you know, you need to oh, yeah. you know, look at it from all aspects because that runs out eventually. You can only tax people so much. And mm -hmm. Bloomington, I think, has, you know, a good tax base that we can build from. Mm. Uh, we just need to prioritize it correctly. Um, and especially if we end up getting flooding like they did two years ago, mm -hmm. you know, which flooded a lot of Kirkwood uh, and ended up ruining several buildings, including one of our fire stations. Uh, you know, we, we need to have a little bit of a rainy day fund as well to help cover things like that and to make investments to prevent things like that from happening on down you, the road as well. I appreciate you mentioning that because I there you're not the only place that has had some flooding. I was in Jay County and they keep talking about the flooding uh, and they're needing to to get some some state assisted funds. Now, I, I, Bloomington is a little different. You guys are sending some blue dot, you know, some some blue dots to the state house and they can only fight so much. But in places like Jay County, where they're sending Republicans to the supermajority, I don't understand why. Jay County is still having issues with infrastructure. I don't get it. I mean, you're sending these people to the state house. I don't get it. All right, Stephanie, talk about TIFFs. So um, I, I think we're talking about the tax increment financing. So really what that's really doing is trying to incentivize development to come to a community and you've got a tax base. 
And then when the project is created, you've got more taxes that are coming in. And for a time period, that allows you to use those taxes to build the infrastructure around the, the project. So if you didn't have that infrastructure to incentivize the project, the project wouldn't come. Mm. And that's one of the things that um, we realized that we needed to be able to help the project. It actually helps us not use other taxes then to be able to focus on, on creating the project there. And then when the project is uh, realized in, in a certain time period, then everybody gets the benefit of those taxes because the project was built. But mm -hmm. again, it's making sure that we have the right development coming to our community. What makes sense? What businesses do we want to attract? You know, in Fort Wayne, we have low cost of living, but unfortunately, some of our jobs are also low paying jobs. Mm. So we need to make sure that we're affecting the uh, the outcomes, too, and being able to attract those businesses that will value our workers and pay them a good paying wage. Yeah, I, so I, I, I think it's, it's a variety of ways to attract them. And then I also should mention, too, about the community development part. I mean, that's what community development does is thinking about where those incentives make sense. So they they talk about, you know, where does the tax phase and make sense? Where does the TIF project make sense? Um, and then they're under I think because they need more resources, we would be able to get more of those things, too, if we thought about how do we attract more funds? One of the things Fort Wayne is lacking is a federal grants administrator. We have couple who are focused on certain departments, but we don't have one who's really focused on the entire city. And the ARPA funds have allowed us to realize why it's so important to go after federal funds to bring them back to Indiana and especially back to Fort Wayne, because those are our tax dollars too. And yep. we want to make sure that we're reinvesting in our community. So yep. things like TIF and other economic development incentives are about investing in our community. I know Marion County, we, we racked it up. Uh, when it came to federal uh, agency funds, you know, because we we are a very unique city, unique city because we are the only consolidated county, and there are a lot of rules that are that are written at the state house that either exclude us or single us out because we are a, a consolidated city. Um, and so, yeah, getting those federal dollars and and having someone petition for those uh, is on it. And 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 Connor, I got to tell you, you know, when you get elected. Could you do me a favor? And I'm going uh, cuz only cuz my girlfriend is watching right now I'm gonna be a brat. Could you make sure that you keep those uh council meetings down to a 3 hour minimum maximum? I, I Bloomington, it's all Democrats. What are y'all arguing about? <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. It's all Democrats. So we don't have Republicans to get mad at. We have each other to get mad at. <laughs> I mean, I would love to have 3 hour meetings though cuz I'm still going to if I assuming you know, I make it through the primary and the general election. I'm going to have classes and probably some of them are going to be at like 945 in the next morning. Yes. So I don't want to be there past midnight for sure. Well, and so that's the thing that, and, and I, and I, I say it, I say it lovingly because I love, you know, Bloomington, you know, it's my officially my second city. Now I know Evansville wanted to claim it and some other places, but it's really my second city now, but I, I really need folks to understand how disrespectful it is to your constituents to have meetings that run that long because they have to go to work in the morning. So Connor, I'm charging you with it. If you win. <laughs> Believe me, I do not want meetings to be that long. The first one I went to was five hours long, and I was like, "Well, that's great." I oh. did not get any homework done or anything. I just sat here the whole time and watched the meeting. So, I, I went to one. I went to one, Connor. It was when I was like, you know, when you're trying to be sweet on your girl, you know what I'm saying? And like, Nicole is the city clerk. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm going to show up and hang out with her. I said, like, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm going home. This is ridiculous. This, I, it, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But no, I'm not. I'm serious because that's just too long. <laughs> that is too long. Guys, we, we're coming up like super close to the end of the show. Um, I got to ask, did I, did I hit on, did I miss anything? Was there something that you really wanted to get out that I didn't ask a question about? Because I want to make sure that, you know, you are sharing your message. It was, it was too, Nicole. It was that bad. <laughs> Is there anything you guys want to get well, out? Like any, 
sounds like you need more efficient government down in Bloomington, which we have in Fort Wayne. Um, we're actually one of the best run cities, but thinking about what that means in, in Fort Wayne is also making sure that we're investing in our people. So uh, feel free to look up to Fort Wayne for some examples on how to run a meeting and, and prepare and, and be able to have those conversations, but then also making sure that you're uh, not having to stay up all night to get those policies made. I love yeah, that. I mean <laughs> In Bloomington, it's really the the rest of the city is great. It's just, just the city council that likes to spend a lot of time debating things and saying a bunch of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, might, it might be better next year. We're gonna have some turnover, so yeah. We'll yeah, yeah, I hope so because it's it's what I'm I'm done picking on Bloomington, but I think it's important. Listen, here's somebody who's running for office who recognizes, look, we can't be having meetings so late because I have to get up and go to class in the morning. And maybe because some of your council folks, and I don't know, don't have those same early morning obligations and, you know, it it again kind of it goes back to Thinking about things that people wouldn't normally think about. If you have to rent, what does it look like? If you have to take public transportation, then what does it look like? If you have to ride a bike, what does it look like? And you're hitting on some really, really heavy hitting points. And I appreciate the different perspective um, that you're bringing to this. All right. Uh, let's, let's see, Connor, do you have, uh, tell the people where they can find you and if you have any upcoming events that they can attend. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram, um, Connor from Bloomington, Twitter, uh, Connor for B Town. It's a letter for up for Twitter, and then Facebook is Connor. Right? I don't really understand how you use Facebook. As a, being being twenty years old, it's uh, wait, it's wait, too hard. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how to take that. You don't know how to use <laughs> Facebook. Get out no, of here. Well, I, I downloaded it specifically for this campaign and I still don't know what I'm doing on there. <laughs> I'm feeling some yeah, kind of way. Also, that's like telling me you don't know how to use women, Connor. That's almost like and this is this is definitely an ageism joke. I just want y'all to understand going into it. It's like you telling me you don't know how to use a slinky or a big wheel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I can probably figure it out. I just I like to spend as little time as possible on there. I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at you. But but do you have any fundraisers coming up? Because people got to donate to you. Yeah, well, we just had our launch party last weekend. Um, the main things coming up are volunteer opportunities. So if anybody's in Bloomington and they want to knock some doors, you know, talk to voters, uh, I can definitely use them. So reach out to me. Uh, you can find my contact information on any of the social media sites or on my website, Connor for Bloomington. And we could definitely use your help. I love it. Connor needs your help in Bloomington. All right, Stephanie Crennel, tell the people where they can find you. Well, I'm a lot more familiar with Facebook because I was still in law school when it came <laughs> out. So I was one of the original users when you had to have a school account to be able to use it. But um, you can find me on my website, crandallwithall.com, and all of my social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook are all at crandallwithall, because that really is my message about making sure that Fort Wayne is serving all of its people. I led the initiative to be recognized as an All-America City for the fourth time, which wasn't just me, it was me putting together the application that highlighted all of the great things that are happening in our community. And so I wanna make sure that we're not just an All-America City, but we truly are a city for all. So all of my uh, ways to reach me is Crandall with all. And uh, I've got some events coming up and you can go to my website, crandallwithall.com and subscribe to find out when those are happening, again, just like Connor, needing volunteers, we're going to be door knocking a lot, uh, making sure it's a big city and I'm running for at large. So I'm serving the entire city. So I'll be coming to all the neighborhoods all across the city and wanting to make sure that I'm hearing from all of my neighbors about, you know, what is it that we can do to make sure that Fort Wayne really is serving every person. And I got to tell you, uh, Fort Wayne is on my, it's like in the front of my brain because that that's our second largest city. And with a population of close to, if not over 200,000 people. Oh yeah, we're about 268 or so. Okay. All right. Very good. I, okay, good. That's even better. Uh, th there's an opportunity for us to do a whole lot of, now they didn't gerrymandered the heck out of it when it can't, comes to what's happening at the state house, but you can't gerrymander a statewide race. 
And so if we can turn out the folks in Fort Wayne and turn them out in Marion County, uh, obviously Bloomington, they turn out. We, we you know, we good. <laughs> but like if we could turn those places out, those are those are that's where we're going to win, you know, pick up seats in the U.S. Senate. That's where we can flip a seat for the governor. But we have to turn Fort Wayne, Evansville, South Bend, Indianapolis, all of our college towns. We have to turn those out. And I'm that's why I was excited to have these two candidates on at the same time. More than one reason. One, yes, hear about their campaigns so that you can learn about what they're doing in their cities. But these are contacts. Hello. These are contacts in your city so that you can, you know, next year we can begin the process again. Um, but we want to get these folks elected. Um, if you liked what they were talking about, click on their donate links um, and so you can donate to their campaign. Every candidate deserves a little help. If you have a few dollars, five dollars goes a long way. So either vote for, or, uh, give both of them some money, not either. Give Connor and Stephanie some money and tell them uh, Indiana's on Dana Black, turn left, sent you. All right. I gotta, I'm, I'm excited about next week's guest. I reached out to um, all of the mayor candidates across the state that who I had a contact for. I reached out to him. Um, uh, Eddie Melton responded. Unfort unfortunately, that fell through. We couldn't get him on. Uh, a couple of the people in Southern Indiana, but only one person from Marion County actually got back with me um, to go ahead and get that scheduled. I, I, I've been trying to get Mayor Hawks in on for a while. So uh, hopefully his team is listening and he'll hum come holler at his homegirl because, you know, me, you know, me and Stephanie, we cool, me and Stephanie. But I got Robin Shackelford, Representative Robin Shackelford, who is running for the mayor of Indianapolis on the show next week. We're going to talk to her. Um, you know, obviously she's running for mayor. I got to hit her up about what's going on in the state house because she's got too much knowledge. She was the leader of the black caucus. She's got way too much knowledge for me not to talk to her about what's happening in the state house. Cause y'all know where that's my passion, but she's looking to run this near million dollar million person city. And if you are wanting to know what's going on in Indiana, however, Indianapolis goes is how the rest of the state goes. I know they, they don't want you to believe that. But why would they make sure we didn't have any at-large seats because Democrats were winning them? Why are we the only one that can't actually vote for our judges? This is the economic hub of the entire state, Indianapolis. And whoever runs this city, who runs this city determines the direction of this city and it has a, a direct influence on what happens the rest of the state. So I... Uh, I want you want to I want to give all the candidates an opportunity. I've got some mayor candidates from Lawrence coming on, um, but unfortunately, I'm begging. Yes, I'm begging. <laughs> hey, y'all want to come talk to the people? Um, but Robin Shackelford will be on next week. I'm really, really super duper excited about having a mayoral candidate from Indianapolis, my home city on the show next week. All right, Indiana's on Dana Black, turn left. Every week we're bringing you the people that are running for office, get to know these folks, donate to their campaigns. We're building our bench. City councils, races are amazing. I love each and every one of those folks because that's where they got to listen to complaints about potholes. <laughs> All right, I will holla at y'all next week. Peace. Turn Left is the property of Black Pearl IT Solutions. Executive producer, Indiana's own Dana Black. Music by www.binsound.com.